Hey guys, it's Brian. It's been a little while since my last posting, and uh, the reason for that is that I've been playing uh, some longer games, half-hour games and one-hour games, uh, to try to get a better feel from that after having played so much Blitz, you know, the last months. So those are obviously harder to record, but uh, I thought I could do a couple post-game recaps on some uh, some hour, one-hour games that I played recently. And uh, they were both in the exchange French defense, the ones we're going to look at. And we're going to do a part one. This will be part one in the first game and part two in the second game. And uh, they sort of highlight two different pawn structures and uh, how play uh, is really separate and, and how play is different when there's two different types of pawn structures. So I played e4, he played, uh, he played e4, I played e6, d4, d5, the French defense. Black, white can push on to... Uh, e5 to do something about the tension here between these two pawns. He can exchange uh, or play knight c3. Um, bishop d3 is not very good because uh, after black exchanges, bishop recaptures, my knight just comes in here and a free tempo on his bishop. So uh, that's why that's not played very often. So he chose to, he chose to exchange and uh, knight f3, knight f6. Now he played c4. Uh, offering the isolated queen pawn, uh, which I didn't take right away, because I figured if he pushed, all right, that would be all right. And if he takes on his own, uh, that's fine. I just don't want to give his, his bishop a nice tempo coming out here. So I instead played bishop before check, just developing the bishop. And uh, I don't mind, you know, exchanging pieces. You know, this guy's making up the opening, so I was like, okay, I'll make up some something in the opening. I'm not even sure you could really call this uh, uh, French anymore. It's like a, like maybe like a Bobo Indian or something. So anyway, castles, and now he does play c takes d5, and uh, before I recapture it, I just flicked in rook to e8 just to get this rook on the file with the tempo because of the check, and uh, this sort of limits his uh, bishop's development. It's you know sort of stuck here on e2, uh, where maybe before he could have tried some kind of development like this, something like that. So anyway, now I decided on knight takes d5, and the characteristic feature of this position is the fact that White has given himself an isolated queen's pawn. This pawn has no pawns on either the e file or the c file that at any point can protect it, and that makes it a weakness, it makes it a target. So what White has to do in these types of positions when he's playing with the isolated queen pawn is play extremely aggressively and extremely like attacking chess sort of against the king or something because uh, the longer the game goes, the more pieces are exchanged, the more of a liability this pawn is going to become. And from Black's point of view, Black wants to set up a blockade of uh, this, uh, this isolated queen's pawn because uh, as... Uh, as often said, the square uh, is not, the pawn itself is not the biggest weakness, but it's the square in front of it, and that's because um, if White can, if White's clever, he can set up uh, types of positions with either the bishop or the queen, for example, on this diagonal. In this case, it's it's not uh, bishop because they're gone, but maybe the queen can end up somehow on this diagonal, and uh, with some pieces like a knight coming into e4. You can imagine a rook coming, uh, you know, like this at some point. At some point, white can just push this pawn and even sacrifice it in order to open up, you know, some kind of attack on the king. So that's why black sets up this blockade. The other reason being, you know, a fixed target is much easier to attack than one that has the possibility to move every time you try to attack it. So, pretty easy plans for me here. Bishop e6, adding another piece to the defense of the blockader. Rook to e1, knight to d7. Okay, maybe knight to c6 was all right here uh, with pressure on the on the weak d-pawn, but my idea was knight to d7 followed by knight to f6. Just another piece uh, to blockade. Uh, knight to c4, c6, adding more defense to this blockader. Knight to e5. So this is 13, 14 moves into the game. This is the position we've reached. And uh, it's kind of funny. The thing about these types of positions are, if you put it into a computer, the computer comes out and says, this is an equal position. 
it looks at various factors. It says, okay, black has a strong knight on e5, um, a nice knight on c4, sort of watching out for his brother on e5. Black has this nice uh, d5 square and, uh, you know, centralized pieces. And it sort of says, okay, chances are equal. But it doesn't take into account because it only knows that, uh, you know, as a computer it plays such good defense and such with such accuracy is that this position is actually way easier for, for the black side to play than it is for the white side to play. Because white has to be creative and drum up something aggressive, uh, probably on black's king. And uh, that's really tough because of all these nice defensive pieces that I have in the area. You know, I'm not off on any... Uh, sort of queenside play or anything like that. You know, just the the plan for black is just to exchange as many pieces as possible and head towards an endgame where this pawn becomes a serious liability for black. Excuse me, for white. So the position is just way, way easier for black to play. So, you know, I think that that should count into uh, some kind of valuation of the position. You know, whether or not your the, the strategies for your side are just way easier to come up with than for the other side. But, of course, computers will tell you it's even because they're just so good at defending and all that. So, in any case, I played queen c7. He played a3. Rook to d8. This shouldn't be a surprise. The rooks are now both centralized, and uh, this rook is supporting the knight and also in putting indirect pressure on the pawn on uh, d4 and also eyeing the queen. So now I'm completely developed, and I have, a, if you ask me, a very nice position. He's uh, going on with a minority attack rather than a kingside attack, uh, which would probably be his best chance to get a win. Um, although a minority attack here, you know, is another sort of plan. The idea is um, in a minority attack, black has these two pawns, white has these two pawns versus black's three pawns, and um, tries to push them down the board and exchange two of the pawns on. Uh, okay, I don't know why my phone won't stop going off. Uh, exchange two of these pawns for two of these pawns in some order, and uh, hope to end up with uh, one, black having one pawn on this side of the board, but that can't be protected either, so it's a weakness, it's a target. That's the idea behind a minority attack. So, And it's just to sort of soften up squares in, in general. So, um, I played queen to e7, just trying to slow down uh, his minority attack, because, uh, I mean, my queen is just sort of not doing much. It also is now off the file with this rook. My queen doesn't actually really have to do anything in these types of positions, just sort of wait around and wait for me to trade off all the other pieces. So this sort of slows down the, uh, the a4 and b5 advance, um, just because uh, of the uh, pawn hanging here. Uh, excuse me, this pawn would be hanging if you were to play a4. Um, maybe he could have played b5 right away as a temporary pawn sack, but, um, you know, b5 takes, knight has to go, and then just protect. Seems like it's just losing a pawn. Yeah, so I don't think there's anything there. Anyway, so slowing a4 down here was the idea of this queen e7 move. So he played queen a4. Um, Okay, he's attacking the A pawn, but he's also slowing his own uh, advance down on the uh, queen side. So it seems rather easy for me to just play uh, A6, sort of, you know, keeping things solid on the queen side, preventing B5 for the moment. So in order for him to get this minority attack going, he's going to have to now move the queen out of the way to be able to push the A pawn. So, he played queen a5. I have no idea what he's doing. He's sort of playing planlessly in this position. Knight to f4. Now I start to take advantage of some of the weaknesses. But the rook is exposing an attack on the d4 pawn. And the knight's also hitting the bishop. So, he's going to be forced now to defend this pawn, which allows me to trade down a piece. And once I've traded down the piece... I just have another piece to come in and blockade. So he plays queen b6 here, trying to guard the pawn in this direction, and maybe put a little bit of pressure on this b pawn. Knight takes e2 check, rook takes e2, and now here, 
actually I had a, a much stronger continuation than what I played. Um, immediately winning is actually bishop takes knight. Uh, the reason for that is because this knight, of course, is pinned to this rook. And uh, if we were to get the move rook takes, then knight d7 is very strong. Okay, again, knight take, if knight takes, uh, then the rook hangs. And uh, if he tries to do something with his queen, say queen takes here, knight takes is very strong. Because if pawn takes knight, then the rook comes in back rank mates, and he's got a very weak back rank and no rooks defending the back rank. And uh, still, even if queen takes queen, this, this is still a problem because of the rook here. So that would have been just winning a piece for me. Um, yeah, if... Uh, what other possibilities were there? Um, yeah, of course, if knight takes d7, then this actually loses both rooks because uh, this rook is on pre and threatening mate. And even if, you know, the rook comes back here, I can just sack the queen and get a back rank mate this way. So that was the best continuation, which I didn't see in the game. Although uh, maybe I should have taken some time to try to find it. Uh, after knight takes e2, rook takes e2, I thought that getting the move knight d5 in again with tempo was... Uh, good enough, and I didn't really look that much further, although I probably should have. He played um, a good move here, I think. Queen c5 is not a bad move in this in this position. Trying to trade queens, and uh, I avoid this, this exchange with the move queen to g5. The reason I avoided the exchange is because if queen takes queen, um, then he has the opportunity to just recapture with the c-pawn. Oh, excuse me, with his weak d-pawn. And now, there's nothing for either side to really play for anymore. Uh, queens are off. Uh, okay, maybe black's rooks are a little bit uncoordinated, but actually this position, to my eyes, looks maybe a little bit better for white, just because of these strong knights. And uh, But really, there's not much for any, either side to play for. There's no pawn structure imbalance, no nothing. So, the move I chose was queen to g4. And uh, I thought this was a pretty good move, hitting the undefended rook and uh, threatening the move knight to f4, which would both attack this rook and threaten mate on f2, or on g2. So uh, what my opponent played instead uh, was a serious blunder. Um, he played the move knight to d6. Okay, the queen guards the rook laterally, and it looks good because uh, you're threatening this this fork. Both knights are threatening uh, this this fork here. But um, what my opponent failed to recall is that uh, this move is impossible because of the simple move rook takes d6, and the rook can't be taken because of this move. Even though this is exactly what happened in the game, and it's mate. His back rank is weak, and the only blocking move is rook here, and, you know, it's mate. So he resigned after queen takes c1. So, uh, serious blunder, knight to d6. Ended the game with rook takes d6. And actually, um, they, the computer told me that this move, knight to f4, was actually stronger uh, than rook takes d6. Um, just threatening this mate and hitting this rook. And maybe maybe they're right. I mean, maybe that was the stronger move. But, you know, I just played this move. It's like you see a free piece, and I just played... Took, I just grabbed the free piece without even thinking about it. And uh, the other thing is like, okay, you grab a free piece, and the computer knows that, you know... The computer knows that... Uh, he wouldn't be able to take this piece, so that wouldn't be as strong as winning a whole rook by playing knight to f4. But as a human player, when you see a move like that, you know you you know that the opponent your opponent played it because he thinks he can recapture with the queen. So you take the piece, and it's like I'll probably re he, there's a good chance I'll retake with the queen, and uh, he did. So that worked out for me there. So that was uh, that was the first game, not a very high quality game by my opponent, but I thought it was a uh, Interesting, just sort of to show you um, 
the various ways that, uh, you know, well, not the various ways, but the most solid way that, that black can play against the isolated queen pawn, which is just to set up a blockade and uh, wait for your opponent to try to do something. In this case, my opponent just made some terrible blunders. Uh, but, you know, if he hadn't, then the strategy would, for me would have just been trade off pieces, find some way to trade off pieces, you know, move this knight, take this take this knight with the bishop, whatever. Just find ways to trade pieces until in the end game, this pawn becomes a serious weakness. So, I'll just do a quick recap. Exchange French with c4, and um, the blockade being set up against the isolated queen pawn. So knight coming to f6 to support the other knight. Okay, this position uh, is fairly even according to the computer, but to me it's advantage black here because this position is just so much easier to play. And uh, white really needs to be looking for either the minority attack or to be playing to try to use these knights to try to launch some kind of kingside attack. You know, with the rooks coming here and the bishops coming out maybe and the queen doing something, so who knows. Got to try to look for some kind of initiative because the longer this pawn is uh, on here without more and more pieces coming off, it's just a weakness. So, queen c7, rook coming. Okay, he starts a minority attack but ends up not finishing it. So, just uh, exchanging some pieces here. And uh, I missed, of course, this tactical variation with bishop takes d4. But uh, in any case, I thought knight d5 was okay. Queen, not interested in the queen exchanges. And uh, the final blunder of the game, knight d6, triple question mark, losing a piece automatically. And, of course, Ned losing the game. So, hope you guys enjoyed that one. We're going to look at another exchange variation French game, but with sort of a different pawn structure. And we'll see how the plans change based on the pawn structure. So, see you next time. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.